Uh, good morning. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. We have colleagues joining us from literally around the globe. So we're delighted that you're with us here today and uh, uh, we're looking forward to a great discussion. My name is Carolyn Reynolds and I'm the co-founder of uh, Pandemic Action Network. Um, and it's a great day. It's a beautiful day here in Washington, DC. It's also my birthday. So delighted to spend my birthday with all of you this morning. Um, I want to first uh, thank our partners for this morning's program or today's program, um, the uh, uh, Japan Center for International Exchange and the University of Tokyo's Institute for Future Initiatives, um, who are co-hosting uh, this event with the Pandemic Action Network. Um, and uh, this is really uh, couldn't come at a more important time. As you know, we're just about a month away from the uh, G7 Leaders Summit, which this year is being hosted by Japan. Um, and uh, over the years, Japan's presidency of the G7, when it has held it, has always been momentous for global health, and we are expecting no less this year. Um, it was uh, uh, from the Global Fund to universal health coverage, um, to health security, uh, to um, uh, pandemic preparedness uh, and response, Japan has always been at the forefront of the global conversation and global initiatives on, on health. Um, and so today, uh, we're really delighted to have this event, which will uh, be an opportunity to share um, publicly the uh, recommendations of the um, of the uh, Hiroshima G7 Global Health Task Force, um, which was formed uh, uh, to uh, give advice uh, and to inform the, G Japan, the priorities for the Japan G7 presidency. Um, they've just released their recommendations for promoting global solidarity toward a more resilient health system. And um, they uh, just appeared actually in the Lancet yesterday. So we will share that link uh, for those who have not yet seen it, hot off the presses. Uh, and our speakers today will uh, dig into those recommendations a little bit. And then we'll also have the opportunity to hear some from some members um, of the global health community from different vantage points, both different geographies and different organizations uh, to share some of their reflections on the task force's recommendations. And um, so without further ado, we're looking forward to a terrific conversation. We have just about an hour and a half and we'll hear from our um, presenters and then we'll have a discussion and we look forward to taking your comments and questions. So without further ado, let me first turn to our partner for this session and our good friend, uh, Tomoko Suzuki. Tomoko is the chief program officer for the Japan Center for International Exchange. Over to you, Tomoko. Mm -hmm. Karen, thank you very much for your kind introduction. My name is Tomoko Suzuki, Chief Roman Officer of Japan Center for International Exchange, JCIE, and I'm serving as a lead coordinator of the Hiroshima G7 Global Health Task Force. First of all, I would like to thank Caroline, Courtney, and other PAN colleagues for making this event happen. And I would also express my appreciation for the commentators and the participants joining this webinar. I'm very happy to have this event right after publishing the key message of our recommendation as a comment uh, in the Lancet. Um, this task force launched last July under the Executive Committee on Global Health and Human Security, a public private policy platform on global health in Japan, organized in 2007 to prepare policy recommendation for the G8 Hokkaido Toyo Summit. The task force is a multidisciplinary group of experts directed by Professor Hideaki Shiroyama, Professor of uh, Public Administration at the University of Tokyo. But we have engaged governor officials of global health related ministries, namely Cabinet Secretariat, Ministry of Health, Foreign Affairs and Finance throughout our process. Um, and this task force has provided plenty of valuable inputs from various stakeholders to global in Japan since last July. And Rosemary is a, one of the commentators today as one of the 33 international advisors of this task force. And they have provided comments and feedback throughout the process. And so I, I would like to thank Rosemary uh, for this opportunity. 
And today we are having two key task force uh, members, Professor Shiroyama, uh, he is the director of this task force, and Dr. Osamu Kuni, CEO and executive director at the GHIT Fund. Uh, GHIT Fund is a global health innovative technology fund. And we have three working groups, uh, USC, Warhammer Day Mission, Access and Delivery, and Global Health uh, Architecture. And Dr. Kuni is uh, serving as a deputy director and a chair of the uh, working group on 100 day mission uh, and access and delivery. And, 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 and Professor Shiroyama, uh, at, this, uh, at this webinar, Professor Shiroyama will share the overview of the recommendations and Dr. Kuni will supplement his uh, presentation on 100 mission and, uh, and access and delivery. Since we are still finalizing the full recommendations at this webinar, two presenters will share some additional points that we cannot cover fully in the Lancet article. So I would like to ask Professor, Yam, uh, Professor Shuriyama to uh, take the floor. Yeah, thank you very much, Suzuki-san. So I'm Hideaki Shiroyama. I am the chair of this task force and also the professor at the Institute for Future Initiative, University of Tokyo, one of the co-hosts of this event. So I'd like to share with you about the overview of the recommendation. We are now in the process of the finalizing the larger version. Then after that, I'd like to ask Dr. Kuni to supplement, especially relating to the research and development and access issue. Okay, can I ask you to share my slide? Yes, the, the title of the, the recommendation is the promote global solidarity for advancing health system resilience. So resilience and solidarity, those are the key two key, uh, two key words of this recommendation. The next please. The basic understanding behind this recommendation is that we are in the era of the destabilization by various crises, including the, you know, the a public health and pandemic issue, of course, but we also have a climate change or the, the food, food issue, food shortage issue, and uh, the political unrest and so on. So th those are the complex risks interacting each other. So to respond to that, we are not just focusing on the separated narrow health issue, but we have to tackle with the complex issue with the, how to say, the, the intersectoral and the multi-level way. So in that respect, one health approach and planetary health approach is very important. But on the other hand, the health issue also directly relating to the, the, the pure national security issue also. So, so in that respect, also we have to tackle with the, you know, the variety of the dimension relating to the, 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 the crisis uh, for the human being. So in that respect, we think that the human security approach, which has been promoted by, China, by Japan is important and that we have it tried to deal with the multi-dimensional um, origins of the, the human existence, and that kind of approach is the basis of our recommendation. Uh, next, please. Okay, so behind that kind of the under, based on that kind of understanding, we try to emphasize the resilience of the health system. So health system have to be resilient in that they have to respond to the you know the various emergency and the crisis. So that, that's a very important uh, purpose of this recommendation. And for realizing this kind of re resilience of the health system, we have to have a global solidarity, even under the current geopolitical tensions. So, so the resilience is the major part of the purpose and the solidarity is a way to achieve that. that that's a basic message of this uh, recommendation. And for that purpose, multi layer global health governance uh, might be necessary, you know, involving the multi-stakeholder collaboration at the national, regional, and global level. The next one, please. And the, as on the concrete issue, we are focusing on the, the three topics. And the first one is the universal health coverage, UHC that is resilient. So the UHC is important and the importance is verified by the current uh, crisis. But on the other hand, you still also have to be resilient. So, so the positioning uh, PPR and the framing of the, the UHC might be needed. And also 
as a source of the, the difficulty for UHC, this structure inequality, inequity issue also have to be dealt with. So that's the first uh, part. And the second part is the 100 days mission plus. So somehow partly following the UK initiative for the 100 days mission, but we try to emphasize more on the access part and the equitable access part. That's how the you know research and development issue is connected to the UHC issue. It's not just about the the the, the research and development issue. The distribution and access have to be uh, institutionalized and accelerated. That, that that seems to be the second component, which is uh, the in indispensable part of the UHC. And third, the theme is the global health architecture. Global health architecture is not a purpose per se. You know, th this is a kind of the instrument uh, to be mobilized to achieve the UHC that is resilient and 100 days mission plus. And uh, as a, the basic nature of the global health architecture, we emphasize the multi-layered the system, the nature of the multi-layer and cross-sectoral and the, uh, the cross levels, national, regional, and global. Th th those are the three main target we would like to focus uh, in our recommendation. The next one, please. So we identify the challenges relating to the three each topic. The next one, please. The first one is the universal health coverage. Uh, there was a kind of the false dichotomy between the health security and the UHC. Those two have to be uh, you know, the pursued at the same time. That, that was actually the message of the Isashima uh, summit, but it's not necessarily implemented well. So the, the how to integrate the two element is one of the major uh, topic. And also the concerning the so sources of the, 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 the difficulty for the universal health coverage, we also identify the non-communicable diseases and also the syndemic nature of the issue. That is the inequality, the vulnerable people have difficulty for uh, access to, to the, the measures. So, so those kind of the issue also have to be dealt with. So those are the, the, the basic challenges we identify relating to the universal health coverage. The next one, please. The, the second the issue is the issue relating to the 100 days mission plus about the, the innovation r and and also the access issue. So the, the one issue is the insufficient global coordination among the r and system, you know, you, you, US and uh, Europe and Japan, and also the lack of the collaboration among the regional research and development financing organization. So that's the first part. Then we identify the issue of the incomplete alignment on the regulatory approaches, the approval process of the medical countermeasures or the clinical trial platform. You know, those are the, the regulatory issues which have to be dealt with. No, it's not just a technical issue, sometimes institutional and regulatory issue are also important. And we also identify the difficulty uh, between the interest, you know, of the high income countries and low and middle income countries about the supply of the, 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 the medical countermeasure, especially the vaccine. And also to deal with that, you know, we need to have a more decentralized manufacturing capability and supply, but uh, the manufacturing capability is somehow limited among the G7 country and also the limited part of the G20 countries, just like India. So, so how to respond to kind of the issue with the major the target for the 100 days mission plus. The next please, the relating to the global health architecture, we don't have uh, in some, the, enough the legal uh, regime and norm to be tackled with. UHC has been the claim in various the forum, but it's not necessarily, you know, the situated in the, the the institutionalized mechanism yet. And also, there is a limitation of the effective governance mechanism for for dealing with the cross sectoral issue, and also for taking a leadership at the head of the state level. So those are the two. The, you know, major issue relating to the global health architecture we 
identified and that the, the current situation of the, the fragmentation, you know, we don't have enough the moment for, for, for joining up the, the various elements of the global health architecture. So those are the, the identified issues. The next, please. So based on those kind of understanding of the challenges, we made recommendations. The, the first one is relating to the UHC, boost country led effort to achieve the UHC. So there, there are several elements relating to that. The first element is the integration of the PPR, prevention, preparedness responses into the UHC. So as a concrete instrument, the primary healthcare and healthcare workforces is a very important issue. The second issue is the issue of the, the non-communicable disease and also the social determinant of health, including the, the societal barrier and so on. So the, the, those issues have to be dealt with. And third one is to promote the harmonization in external assistance for the country that effort to achieve the UHC. The basic understanding behind that is that, you know, UHC is important, it has been emphasized in various occasions, that's fine. But at this moment, it might be important to think about the concrete steps, the roadmap to achieve that, depending on the situation of the, each country. So, and for that purpose, harmonization of the external support is important, together with the mobilization of the domestic resources. And to make sure the progress for the goal, we have to have a accountability mechanism to make the situation transparent. And also the global knowledge hub supporting those kind of institutional setting might be necessary. So this part is one of the uh, emphasis in our report, especially relating to the UHC. The next one, please. The second component is the ensure comprehensive approach to advance timely and equitable access to life-saving medical countermeasures. So this will be uh, the detail by the Kuni Sensei later, but I just would like to mention some of the Ichiwa, you know. The one thing is that, you know, the accelerating the research and development is important. That that's following the UK approach to the 100 mission for prioritizing the pathology to be targeted. And in addition to the vaccine, the diagnostics and the therapeutics also should be targeted. And also the response to the AMR issue is also the important target for, for the R&D. But in addition to that, access is emphasized in our report, the timely access and equitable access. So as an example, the terminal at timely access, you know, the trade should not be restricted, or regulatory alignment should be pursued, and the clinical trial platform should be established. And also the regional manufacturing, decentralized system might be important. And that, that's emphasized in our report. Then we also promote the always on approach. So the purpose of the dual purposes technology should be promoted so, so that uh, resources can be uh, utilized complementary during the crisis time and inter crisis time. And also, finally, access initiative is important to link between the RD activity and delivery and access issue. The, the next one, please. Uh, finally, relating to the global health architecture, we emphasize the importance of the multi-layered approach. So the point of the multi-layered approach is that we cannot do everything at the global level, but at the global level, there is some dispensable, indispensable function to be pursued, including the norm setting relating to the UHC or One Health, and some global level international financing mechanism and the global governance to oversee the overall multi-sectoral, multi-layered the, the system. So that's one thing. But in addition to that, in various aspects, the regional hub is becoming important for the effective surveillance or the health emergency workforce or manufacturing and procurement. So the regional dimension also should be and, uh, respected and promoted. And then multi-sectoral approach to address the comprehensive and interdisciplinary nature of the issue should be dealt with. As I mentioned at the beginning, the climate change have to be dealt with and the one health approach is needed. And also inclusiveness and equity involving the civil society organization and so on. That, that, that's also the important part of the, the, the global health architecture. 
Okay, so th th those are the, the, the major message uh, from our recommendation. Uh, so I'd like to finish here and I'd like to uh, give my mic microphone to uh, uh, the Dr. Kuni. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Professor uh, Sirayama. Would you show that uh, page 11 of uh, uh, slides? It is kind of summary of um, this uh, MCM, that 100 days mission, yes, uh, 11, yes, that's right. Thank you very much. So I, I would like to describe a bit kind of more uh, in detail. Uh, this first one, acceleration of R&D for MHCM, including a lot of things, not only just privatizing pathogen, diagnostics, uh, therapeutics, AMR, et cetera, but uh, acceleration, of course, including the funding, and the coordinated way of uh, you know, research and uh, kind of a collaboration between a venture, uh, academia, big farmer, uh, you know, that uh, uh, the public uh, the research institute, et cetera. So uh, all kind of collaboration. And uh, we also emphasize that the importance of end-to-end uh, -end the MCM, you know, research and development to uh, uh, timely access and delivery as well. So, uh, you know, we really recommend the kind of end-to-end -end things. And we also feel that uh, uh, this uh, MCM, uh, R&D for MCM, especially the vaccine is quite well advanced, but not so much in uh, uh, diagnostics. So uh, it is kind of one of the important things uh, to emphasize. Uh, this timely access to MCM, actually, um, it it was a bit kind of difficult to uh, put uh, all the kind of detailed recommendation in this access part, because as you know, uh, access includes the pricing, uh, patent, and uh, all the kind of other things. But, uh, you know, uh, kind of detail needs to be discussed among uh, especially G7 countries and also uh, the uh, big farmer and um, public sectors. So uh, we didn't uh, give a kind of concrete uh, uh, idea or kind of direction, but uh, uh, it also need a further discussion. And of course, the trade for regulatory alignments and these uh, you know, clinical trial platforms are quite critical. Actually, this uh, you know, regulatory alignment and the clinical trials platforms are currently uh, well uh, kind of discussed for coordination, alignment, or harmonization. So uh, uh, I, we believe that you know it will be a kind of a, a quite progressive and going quite uh, quickly. And the regional manufacturing is also uh, uh, well uh, kind of organized or coordinated in the country uh, in the world, as you might know that the World Economic Forum support and uh, you know uh, this uh, regional um, that uh, manufacturing uh, collaboratives is uh, quite active in this one. And uh, uh, promote equitable access to MCM. Yeah, so uh, equitable access includes, of course, uh, uh, allocation and other, other issues. So it's also quite important one. Number four, this is promoting always on approach, meaning um, even in a peacetime uh, kind of effort, not only just for preparedness for pandemic, but also uh, acceleration of uh, R and D uh, and access and delivery of uh, you know silent pandemic or uh, the pandemic and endemic in the world like uh, HIV, TB, malaria, uh, neglected tropical diseases, AMR uh, would be very important. And as you know, that the vaccine, there are a lot of vaccines available, but uh, still not the reaching all kind of people in need. So uh, this always on means that, uh, you know, the putting not only for uh, the, our the emphasis and the effort for pandemic, but also, you know, that uh, all the kind of needs uh, in uh, peacetime as well. Uh, two, that's five, launch global inclusiveness, yeah, access initiative. Yeah, this is, as I said, that the, this access um, is a really kind of critical. So uh, this should be uh, very much uh, well uh, initiated for the promoting. And as you know, that the ACTA, ACTA, ACTA accelerator already has a kind of a, a evaluation and they are also making so much kind of effort. 
So uh, we really need to use this momentum of uh, accelerating R&D and uh, better kind of alignment and uh, collaboration for the access and delivery uh, to be you know, well linked. And uh, um, also linking with uh, uh, other, the UHC and also uh, global health architecture, we feel that you know, MCM, of course, this uh, you know, pandemic pre preparedness and response prevention, these are very, very critical, but there are many other issues. Uh, so uh, we really need to see that kind of commonality uh, of, uh, you know, that uh, uh, to make an effort, but not only for pandemic preparedness response, but also for other uh, the uh, critical diseases and health issues as well. As uh, uh, Professor Shiroyama mentioned, that clean, uh, climate change uh, and other kind of uh, health threats uh, also uh, could be, you know, that jointly making kind of effort for through kind of similar kind of platform. And of course, there are uh, quite a, a critical needs for some, some of the kind of vertical approach, but, uh, you know, under uh, UHC, uh, we really need to uh, kind of uh, try to uh, integrate variety of uh, effort. Okay, I think i uh, better to stop here. Yeah. Okay, stop here. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much, Dr. Kuni uh, and Dr. Shiriyama for that uh, rich presentation. You've given us a lot of food for thought. Um, I want to... Um, uh, flag to our audience that there is a Q&A function at the bottom of your screen, Zoom screen, so you can click on that and post questions or comments to the panelists, and uh, we will be getting into a discussion shortly, um, and uh, so please do avail yourself of that. Um, I also want to just pick up on the last point that you make, Dr. Cooney, because it was so important. So the task force has outlined three major themes and priorities for action on universal health coverage, on the 100 Days Mission Plus, and on the global health architecture, which, although that is the title, I understand, also includes financing, and maybe we can come back to that as well. Um, but I think your last point is so important about the interconnectivity across the global health agenda, and in fact, across the global development agenda. And I think from the perspective, our perspective with Pandemic Action Network, and I know many people on this call, um, we are concerned that there is this already this um, pivot back to uh, panic and neglect to uh, putting this crisis of COVID, which is not yet over behind us, um, and sort of attending to the next issue. And of course, we have some very real needs related to pandemic prevention preparedness response that need uh, additional attention, need uh, reforms to the global architecture, many of the things you've laid out here, but also need, um, need uh, uh, new investment. Um, and then likewise, we have existing global health issues and initiatives that need to be fully funded. So this, we really need the ambition <laughs> of this G7 presidency, but of all the G7 leaders uh, to think bigger, think differently and think additionally. Um, and to ensure that we are not looking at these issues in a silo or just whatever is the current crisis du jour. So with that, let me turn to, um, we have a few uh, of our colleagues who will make some initial reflections on the tax forces recommendations and then we'll open it up for a wider discussion. First, let me call on our friend Rosemary Mburu, who's executive director of Wacky Health. And as Tomoko alluded to in the beginning, has also been an advisor to the task force. Rosemary, over to you. Thank you very much, Caroline, and thank you for all this presentation. So it's my pleasure to share very quick reflections um, out of the presentation that has been shared. And also, I think, first of all, to say as a member of the Global Health Task Force, it's really great to see that the recommendations that have been presented here have really taken into consideration uh, input and, and a consultative process. And even as the presentation is going on, I can see inputs that have been provided along the path and to see the recommendations as they look right now is uh, a, a great uh, commendation to the team that has been putting that together. 
I hear a couple of very important uh, themes and, and key points for me. The first thing I hear is uh, global solidarity and local leadership. Um, the whole framing of the recommendations are that they really have to be enabled and facilitated through global solidarity, uh, especially in terms of financing and governance. We are coming from a point where in the past, whether it's from our the real experience from the HIV movement in terms of introduction of medicines, or it's in the COVID-19 situation in terms of introductions of vaccine, the great challenge around um, equitable financing, uh, the inequity in terms of access to resources, access to power, but also in terms of governance, the inequity in terms of access to voice, access to representation. Um, is something that I see in the recommendation where the whole framing is on, on global solidarity with financing and governance at the center. And I think that can be unpacked to see what the details are there. The issue around country leadership is very important, especially for low and middle income countries. It brings up the issue of domestic resources, domestic resource um, investment. It brings out, up the issue around localization, the localization agenda. But also it gives those of us in low and middle income countries an entry point to, to demand social participation in national decision making processes, which is very important for us. For the other, within the UHC theme uh, that is being proposed, it's really great that we are proposing integration. So looking at integrating health system strengthening for uh, pandemic prevention, uh, you know, preparedness and response into national UHC strategies. But I think what is fundamental for me as someone who's sitting in Kenya and looking at uh, the devastating impact of COVID-19 into our health systems is that the recommendation is that the entry point and the focus is on primary health care. And that means a lot because when you begin to unpack primary health care, you have to answer questions of human resources for health. You have to answer uh, questions Questions around, for example, in Africa, community health workers and their role, remuneration. Uh, you have to answer questions around community systems strengthening and the, the entire ecosystem uh, of, of health system that includes community systems. And that's really important, especially in areas where you know community health workers or the community system is really one of the strongest backbone of the health system. I think the issue around within UHC, making sure that even as we work towards making progress on UHC, we are not forgetting the interaction on the non-communicable diseases, the interaction with infectious diseases. And I think really important, the social determinants of health, that's very important, including looking at the social barriers. Uh, what is making us and some people not access services? What is making some people actually be missed by health systems? Uh, during uh, pandemic situations, but even looking further to uh, when we are actually looking at prevention of, of pandemics, and that's really important. When we think about the R&D component, the 100 days, um, it, it really goes beyond uh, talking about the R&D and the pipeline uh, in terms of uh, product development to really zero into access and delivery. And in this case, talks about a timely, like timely delivery, very important, but also talks about equitable access. It's, it's a lesson you know, from COVID-19. It's a lesson from HIV in terms of access to, to ARVs. And I think we are still fighting some of those uh, struggles, but the recommendation reflects on that reality and makes a recommendation around ensuring that it's not just uh, product development, it's also like inviting us to think about delivery and access. And what enables that? Is it uh, working with countries to identify delivery modalities that work at the country level? Is it looking at the challenges um, of absorption at the country level in terms of how do you move it from the warehouse to actually um, to where the um, communities are and, and can access that? Is it coming up with community engagement mechanism? It helps us to have a conversation around that and unpack the challenges we've been there. Then if you look at um, investments in R&D, it's important that we see the value of investing in health R&D 
now. Sometimes it's discouraging because of the long term horizon, but if we invest now and put in scaled up long term investment, it helps us in the long run. And the issue around the global health architecture, that's a really important one because I think we have, it, it helps us to interrogate and, and really look at the reality that the kind of global health architecture we have now, is it fit for purpose in terms of helping us uh, to prevent, prepare and respond to future pandemics? And even the pandemics we are fighting right now is the global health architecture as it is right now. So the recommendation around thinking very much around the inequity of resources and voice is very important. And it's been pointed um, around financing and governance. It's also been pointed around diversification and expansion, especially in terms of manufacturing and procurement, and helps us to begin to think about and unpack um, the area around uh, regional manufacturing. How do we capacitate that? How do we diversify that? So these are the recommendations and the key points I have picked uh, from the presentations and the recommendations that have been made. And I look forward to hearing um, other reflections from other colleagues and maybe additional questions. Thank you very much. And back to you, Caroline. Thank you so much, Rosemary. Always rich, uh, as always, with lots of things to think about. And again, um, connecting those dots across these three themes. Um, let me, and uh, we've gotten, we're getting in some good questions and comments, which we'll turn to shortly. Um, so keep them coming in the Q&A box. Um, uh, next, I want to turn to Dr. Nabil Gohir, who's Chief of Asia, Middle East, and Europe region for PATH. Uh, Nabil, over to you. Well, thanks, uh, Carolyn. A very good afternoon from London. PATH is grateful to PAN and JCIE for convening this important conversation. We appreciate the hard and smart work of the task force. And may I say, Omedeto Guzaimas. Congratulations for a strong set of recommendations. Yes, the world is in the grip of poly crisis. These crises are competing to get our attention. It's unfortunate, but we are in good hands, in Japan's hands. I personally and profoundly appreciate Japan's approach to health security. It is anchored in human security a concept championed by late and great Ogata-sama from Japan and Professor Amartya Sen from India. On this very note, Path is pleased to see the reference to health workforce. We are in the World Health Worker Week. Let's take a moment to appreciate their contribution. They play a critical role in pandemic response. The sad truth is that we have always underinvested in them. We believe that investing in the health workforce strengthens health system resilience. It furthers the goal of reaching universal health coverage. We recommend the broadest possible framing on health workforce. We must prioritize and remunerate community health workers, nurses, and doctors. But let's not forget lab technicians, epidemiologists, regulatory experts, and public health workers. In addition, I would echo the task force recommendation on supporting the efforts of LMICs to improve integration across PPR, including actions to address antimicrobial resistance. Surveillance, we believe, is critical for detecting early signs of outbreaks and responding promptly. Now, let me change gears a little bit now <laughs> in, in my comments. Many of you would know that PATH is an organization that focuses on health innovation. We welcome the recommendations related to enhancing R&D for medical countermeasures. This is music to our ears. And R&D sounds great, but I agree with what Carolyn and, and the presenters have said. 
it sounds a bit solo. Let's make it a symphony. And here are a few thoughts. Firstly, we must design for equitable delivery from the start. We cannot rely on the global supply chains and charitable intentions for essential health products. Every region of the world must have some capability to manufacture products to meet their health needs. The task force can catalyze investments in manufacturing to ensure supply security around the world, particularly in Africa. Secondly, R&D is an ecosystem. Products are developed by researchers and companies. They're registered by regulatory agencies. They're produced by manufacturers. They're incorporated into policy by public health authorities. They are accessed through functioning health systems. If we fail to support the entire ecosystem, we shall fail to reach people. Thirdly, I want to make another systemic point. We need to learn from the pandemic. We ought to emerge with a clear picture of the financing, governance, and coordination mechanisms. Together, we must build an inclusive system, which is fair, networked, and well-coordinated. Both the WHO and India's G20 presidency are working on the ways for coordinating, resourcing, and equitable delivery for medical countermeasures. At PATH, we are working with the G20 presidency in India to build consensus for a global vaccine research collaborative. And with the private office of the president of South Africa to build consensus for greater investments in a sustainable ecosystem for medical countermeasures manufacturing. We are pleased to be part of these important global mechanisms. And we believe that better coordination is critical for a safer tomorrow. In closing, I would say, let's not forget the centrality of human focus in our efforts. This is very close to our hearts, as is uh, for Japan. Let's be more systematic and systemic in our approach. And let's not forget the last mile to build a safer world. Thank you. Over to you, Carolyn. Thank you so much, Nabil. Some really um, points that resonate very much with me and I'm sure with many in the audience and um, um, on all of these issues around systemic, uh, systemic change and, um, and essentially building a fair, equitable system. Uh, and again, I want to acknowledge your points at the beginning about health workers in particular, particularly this week when we honor them around the world. Um, again, we're getting in some more questions. P please bring them. You can also raise your hand in the chat. Um, I have, I'd have. like to turn now to our um, partner, Glide. Uh, Ngozian Rondu is Technical Director for the Global Institute for Disease Elimination, Glide. Um, Ngozi, over to you for some thoughts and reflections. Thank you, Caroline. And good afternoon from Dubai. And I want to just thank PAN and GCIE for this opportunity to reflect on this discussion. And thank you to the members of the Hiroshima G7 Global Health Task Force for eloquently articulating these recommendations that clearly outline and suggest the application of the lessons that we've all learned as a global community on how to prepare and respond to global health crises. The Global Institute for Disease Elimination, also known as GLIDE, is rooted in the United Arab Emirates. And that allows us the advantage of proximity to partners in both the global north and the global south. Yet we know that the world is not so cleanly divided. And since pathogens do not respect borders, it's important to have a global health architecture that is connected, communic communicative, and coordinated. So we applaud the task force's emphasis on global solidarity, through the actions of strengthening health systems that can absorb shocks and respond to both primary healthcare and emergency needs. Glide, as a nonprofit organization and a catalytic partner for disease elimination efforts, agrees that only country-led approaches will help achieve this. 
and that partners must be complementary and additive. In our work with countries and partners, we see that while neglected tropical diseases, malaria and polio are not often categorized as emergencies, these persistent diseases are certainly barriers to human development and economic prosperity, and they threaten to exacerbate health emergencies such as outbreaks and pandemics. Uh, neglected tropical diseases or NTDs, they refer to 20 diseases defined by WHO, which includes lymphatic filariasis, onchocerciasis, also known as river blindness, uh, schistosomiasis, leprosy, and other diseases. It's estimated that nearly 2 billion people the, from the most vulnerable communities suffer from one of these diseases of poverty. And many of these diseases can be eliminated, but the resources to ensure that countries are able to reach the last mile are scarce. While several bilateral and transnational partners invest in NTD in the control and elimination of NTDs, funds have reduced drastically due to the changing geopolitical realities that was referred to in the, um, in the presentation, but also the tightening of development funds. Now, this makes for an uncertain future for many populations globally, even as we consider that the impact of climate will have, um, well, the climate crisis will have an impact on vector transmission and the spread of infectious diseases to places uh, that were not, were, were not formally endemic to NTDs. Now, Japan has led globally in this space. And it has this unique uh, public-private partnership uh, that Dr. Uh, Cooney leads, uh, the GHIT, uh, the Global Health and Innovation Technology Fund, or the GHIT Fund, which is dedicated to the development of drugs from malaria, tuberculosis, and NTDs. To date, Japan has invested approximately 27 billion yen, or over 200 million U.S. dollars, which has led to the development of new medicines to combat some of these devastating diseases. However, due to the lack of an internationally established mechanism to deliver products and commodities to patients from endemic countries, many of these life-saving technologies from Japan and other product develop developers will not reach affected countries. So it's very much what the previous speaker, uh, Dr. Nabil, said about there being this you know, research and development ecosystem that has to include access to uh, the products and technologies as well. Now, recognizing Japan's leadership in this space, we asked the task, force to, the task force to articulate the need for the G7 to prioritize funding of the NTD value chain and the replenishment of the Global Fund and Gavi. This is to ensure that gains made in fighting these diseases are not lost by neglect and underfunding. Let me be clear that we are not promoting the notion that the Global Fund extends its mandate to cover NTDs, but we strongly support global fund rep replenishment for strengthening sustainable and resilient health systems, and we strongly endorse integration efforts. Similarly, the Gavi replenishment in 2025 is an important moment for investment in human security. Backtracking on routine immunization is a global threat. Regarding integration, we further request that the task force elevate the call from the WHO NTD director, Dr. Ibrahim Asose Fao to integrate and mainstream neglected tropical diseases in primary health care to achieve universal health goals. Japan's G7 presidency and its longstanding leadership in investing in NTDs, malaria, and TB is a unique combination to significantly impact the lives of the most vulnerable globally. We hope that along with emphasizing NCDs and antimicrobial resistance, NTDs and, elim and elimination efforts will also be raised as priorities. Thank you for your time and attention. Thank you so much, Ngozi, and um, also for bringing in those angles on the broader health challenges um, related to NTDs. Um, and, uh, and then, of course, as you mentioned, NCDs and AMR, there's so many challenges, right, on the, on the global health agenda. Um, that need solving and that have actually um, where we have um, lost progress um, as a result of the pandemic, which calls for the global community to step up and do even more just to get us back on track, let alone to accelerate progress towards the sustainable development goals. So thank you all for those rich comments. I wanna ask our, uh, my colleagues if we can put all our speakers on camera, uh, back on camera and um, we have a number of questions in the chat. A lot of them have are quite uh, uh, specific to the R&D side of the agenda. So before I turn to those, let me maybe 
ask uh, Dr. Shiriyama and Dr. Kuni if you'd like to um, share any quick reflections, thoughts on what you heard from our other speakers. Um, and also maybe to ask you, what has been the initial response, uh, if you can share, from uh, the Japanese government and from G7 counterparts to the initial recommendations? I know that you are still finalizing some things, but obviously the broad themes and messages are out there. So um, any quick reflections on what you've just heard, uh, as well as uh, thoughts on where you see the most interest and traction from uh, the Japanese government and from G7 counterparts. Uh, Dr. Shirama, over to you. Yeah, thank you very much for your very important and uh, co comments. And uh, yes, I'd like to uh, comment on a few of them. Then also I'd like to mention about the coconut response of the Japanese government to our recommendation. Relating to the issue, you know, Caroline is at the beginning, and uh, we are now in the multiple crisis, and uh, many issues need resources, and how we can respond to that. That's a kind of big issue. That's true. So one of the, the important element of the response we try to emphasize is the integration and the complementarity, and so on, because you know the issue have to be do not need to be responded in the separate way. Sometimes response to one issue can be helpful for responding to other issue also. So how to make sure the kind of the complementarity is very important and the integration, which is emphasized at the several level, also can be helpful for facilitating the kind of the complementary relations. And relating to that, the, you know, I emphasize the, the nature of the multi-layer governance and intersectoral collaboration, the nature of the global level response. But really, that's very important at the local level. The, as was emphasized, that the, the community level healthcare system is very important responding to the various crisis. And health workforce is one of the pillars for responding to that. So the kind of the complementarity and the integration have to be organized, not, not at the global level. Global level is necessary, but what's more important might be the community level or the regional level and so on. So on. So that, that is a kind of the basic message uh, we'd like to co convey relating to the, the fundamental question Caroline put at the beginning. And that's my first response. And the response by the, the, the government of Japan so far, the basically, you know, the government of Japan and other country also are very favorable uh, to the emphasis on the, the UHC at this moment, uh, which, is, which need to be resilient. But after the three years of the crisis, and we have to, how to say, the design the new system responding to the new normal. So, so of course, the, the responses so far is important. The UK put on the put emphasis on the 100 days mission, R&D aspect, and uh, Germany put on the emphasis on the pact, you know, focusing on the surveillance and the workforce. That's, that's important, but how to make sure the kind of system work? Uh, thinking about that kind of issue, now back to coming back to the issue of the universal health care, is not just because of the Japanese that that's a Japanese favorite topic. Maybe at this top, timing, I think coming back to the systemic issue is very important, and, and there is a general consensus on that. So in that respect, uh, very positive about the, the recommendation. But of course, concerning the detail, there is some gap. You know, for example, we try to emphasize the you know, the, the boost, boost the country that effort to achieve UHC and the kind of the accountability mechanism focusing on the each country should be established. The, under the current, the, the draft of the declaration of the, the G7, you know, the, some global action plan for the UHC seems to be an important part of the recommendation, but that, that does not necessarily dealing with the detail of the country level accountability mechanism. That, that's my understanding. So generally, the positively appreciated, but still there is some gap concerning the detail. That, that's my understanding uh, uh, concerning the current situation. Uh, thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Um, I would like to uh, respond to some of the comments and the questions. Uh, first, uh, you know, the community response and uh, community system strengthening is very, very critical. As you see that, uh, you know, especially in Africa and some other countries or regions, quite top-down uh, response to COVID really kind of, uh, you know, 
initiated such kind of a community system. That is why when I was working in a global fund, uh, I was kind of uh, the chief and head of uh, the strategy investment investment uh, in the uh, impact division. And at the time, we tried to um, uh, mobilize uh, the community resources and uh, try to work with uh, you know quite conventional the global fund that related the community uh, communities. But uh, together with the other, you know, that the primary health care or maternal child health uh, type of uh, communities. So uh, we felt that, you know, this community uh, system is very, very critical. And of course, the human resources uh, in the community level, very, very critical. That is why, you know, uh, in our recommendation, this under UHC and the human security and others, this community's, uh, you know, the role uh, is very much emphasized. And also a primary health care is very much well, uh, you know, emphasized. So please uh, I think about that. And uh, uh, yeah, systematic or systemic um, the approach is critical, but quite easy to say, but very difficult to do. And especially, you know, uh, when I was working in Global Fund, we felt, uh, you know, there are a lot of, uh, you know, kind of vertical systems and vertical approaches, you know, from variety of uh, NGOs, international organizations, uh, even, in, you know, including Global Fund, Gavin, et cetera. And it's not, not so easy to have um, very much systematic approach. So one of the critical things we also recommend in our you know, G7 uh, DSS task force is uh, quite country-led kind of a planning. So uh, under UHC, we support uh, you know, country-led uh, the UHC planning or roadmap, et cetera. As you might know, there is a global action plan, but it is a bit kind of a you know, global level um meeting gathering and uh, discussion but quite you know global level so we really need to you know improve that kind of roadmap more kind of actionable and especially supporting country each country to make a very uh systematic or uh, the uh systemic kind of a plan but uh, more kind of detailed with uh, privatization and uh you know resource mapping etc and uh, uh, human resources is one of the core in that, and the financing is also very core, because as you know, uh, external or the funding is not at all enough. Even global fund, we collect a lot of money, but it is very much kind of a uh, you know lack of uh, uh, that the resources uh, compared to the real kind of uh, requirement. That is why uh, innovative financing or domestic financing is also very critical. So that kind of systematic or systemic planning need to include also that's kind of do domestic, uh, the, you know, the financing and also um, kind of a sustainability planning uh, for future as well. Okay, and uh, okay, procurement. Actually, as you know, this access and delivery is also a quite critical and it's not so easy because uh, some of the countries have uh, more than hundred, you know, the vertical, channels or systems of procurement, as you know, WHO system of procurement for WHO's essential drug, uh, UNFPA, uh, Global Fund, and, uh, you know, the uh, Red Cross, etc. So uh, we also need to look at, uh, you know, the supporting countries for integration, uh, even for, you know, procurement and uh, kind of allocation and distribution, et cetera. Uh, we feel, okay, I just want to mention that some of the initial response um, from uh, government, they are very much, especially Japanese governments, very much interested to support uh, uh, this access and delivery and especially last one mile. Um, so um, they are seriously thinking and currently they are having a kind of consultation with other uh, G7 uh, countries representatives. So. Uh, uh, already, you know, they are kind of uh, <laughs> uh, seriously discussing. And one of the things I have to mention is a hundred days mission, which was uh, proposed uh, by uh, UK government. That term, hundred days mission itself, is a bit kind of uh, uh, sensitive. I've heard that uh, uh, some of the countries are not so much uh, agreed upon that one, even plan itself. So um, maybe we uh, they may change the name uh, from hundred days mission toward we're not so sure finally, but maybe innovation or acceleration of R&D and uh, uh, access and delivery, et cetera. But they are quite aware of the importance of end-to-end -end, you know, kind of service. 
and uh, both uh, of uh, you know R and D and access and delivery uh, to be handled together. And uh, alignment and coordination is very much critical. Better to stop here. Thank you. Thank you both um, for that rich feedback. Um, so much to dig into. We have about a half an hour left in our program. So about 15, 20 minutes left for discussion. Um, so we have a number of questions. We will get to as many of them as we can. And um, I may throw back in a few of my own, particularly on that last point, that uh, set of points that you made, Dr. Cooney. I, I do, I guess, uh, my, from using the, the privilege of the chair, I would say, it would be great um, in the final, final version of this to see more emphasis on financing and not just on domestic financing and innovative financing, which yes, are important, but at the end of the day, there needs to be more public finance in the system um, at all levels. And yes, governments themselves need to do more and need to budget more, but we also know that there has been a significant economic downturn uh, particularly in uh, the, the lowest income countries um, directly as a result of this pandemic. We know that there's uh, um, many more countries than there were a few years ago in debt distress. Fiscal space is very tight, competing priorities, um, you know, devastation, frankly, of health systems in many countries. So we have to, we actually have a hole to dig back out of at a time when countries are very constrained in terms of spending more money. So that does mean they do. we want to raise that ambition to do more, but in the meantime, the global community has a responsibility to do much more in terms of uh, uh, finance. And uh, I think as we talked about uh, in our conversations with the task force, ensuring that there is, uh, we just created a pandemic fund for that very purpose to create um, the opportunity for more international investment. That has a very small capitalization now. Um, but yet huge demand, $7 billion in terms of expressions of interest uh, for a very, for a few hundred million dollars currently on offer and only about 1.6 billion that's been pledged so far. Um, so it would be terrific to see that G7 really needs to rally around that effort and make sure that is uh, sustain fully and sustainably capitalized, uh, but also then to look at where the gaps are. There is a highlight from the task force on the surge financing issue, which also needs to be solved uh, discreetly, right? We need also a, 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 a financing solution for that. But um, let's start with also, let's, we need to do that. Let's start also with the initiatives that have already been tabled and supported by the G7 and G20 and make sure those are fit for purpose. Um, we have a number of questions uh, then, uh, particularly on the R&D front. So let me uh, tick through, through those rapidly. And then there's a couple more on the broader front and then we'll come back to our speakers. So um, let me actually turn to Christine McNabb, who had a question um, on local R&D and LMICs. Christine, if you wanted to ask your question, the floor is yours. Oh, thank you very much. Good morning, everyone uh, from Toronto. Um, just what, wanted your views on uh, the issue of uh, local research and development and investing in that. Um, there's a, a group that had a comment in The Lancet about three or four weeks ago. Uh, talking about the fact that R&D investment locally is critical to ensure that there are um, uh, products that are produced that, that address local, local conditions. So just wanted your, your uh, views on that, uh, as, as, and maybe compared with is the wrong term, but uh, you know, we're also seeing a lot of the sort of container manufacturing happening, uh, which is providing manufacturing capacity in lower income countries, but um, will that solve all the problems? So thank you very much. Thanks, Carolyn. Thanks, Christine. Um, I'm going to go to in rapid fire some of the other R&D related questions, uh, which probably uh, and then come back to you. Um, so we have a question in the Q&A from our friend Jamie Nishi at the Global Health Technologies Coalition, who asked me to read out her question, a question for Dr. Cooney. How can we better frame for G7 leaders that investments in R&D capacity strengthening can support emerging infectious diseases and poverty related neglected diseases at the same time? The financing conversations feel like they continue to be siloed between pandemic preparedness and other health areas. So while you think about that, Dr. Cooney, let me also then go to um, uh, Jamie's colleague, um, uh, Philip Keenall. Philip, uh, you had a couple of questions in the chat. Maybe you can synthesize those if you'd like to um, ask them. The floor is yours. Okay, thank you very much. So uh, there are some kind of specificity and also commonalities between uh, especially pandemic um, 
uh, the pathogens and uh, you know other neglected tropical diseases in others, uh, especially you know that they are prioritizing the viral diseases, even seven to ten you know viral diseases, quite easier uh, than uh, NTD and others because of. Uh, for example, malaria has uh, more than 3,000, uh, you know, de uh, gene, uh, but, uh, you know, the viral has uh, just uh, only 20 or 30. So easier to identify the an antigen and um, uh, other ones, and uh, quite easier to be prepared for the uh, the, um, the prototype uh, vaccine and others. But, of course, there are some commonalities, especially uh, we could uh, the accelerate uh, the clinical trials and also approval process uh, for both. So uh, we also need to, you know, look at okay, what kind of areas uh, we could, uh, you know, the accelerate R and D for maybe most of the older, you know, pandemic or endemic, etc. But what that kind of a specifics only for, you know, NTD or only for uh, that the pandemic. So uh, we also need to look at the kind of uh, allocation of money or the resources and also a kind of joint work of uh, uh, that that one. So uh, yeah, it is my response. And the other one is uh, you know the local uh, the R and D uh, that um, uh, transfer you know technical transfer actually already uh, ongoing as you might know. For example, Senegal has a uh, uh, quite a good uh, you know new investment in the R and D for you know, pandemic and even neglected tr tropical disease. And as you know, that Kenya and the South Africa, they have, and uh, Japan uh, is providing a lot of technical transfer in Vietnam, uh, Thailand, and et cetera. And messenger RNA, they are also kind of thinking to, to provide. So uh, I think um, uh, such kind of interest is there and some of the in investment is there, but maybe coordination is quite important. Because uh, if uh, each you know country or uh, the academia farmer doing you know the, by their own, uh, we will just lose uh, you know the kind of efficiency. So uh, we really need to have a good uh, global planning and also regional planning and local planning for for kind of um, the synergistic kind of efforts. So here. Thank you, Dr. Kenny. Um, let me turn to uh, actually um, our other colleague from GHTC. Philip Keenall, who had a couple of questions and maybe to pull those together. Philip, over to you. Sure, thank you so much, Carolyn. And actually on, on that last point, it's a great segue because I think my question, one of my questions was related to exactly that point of coordination of R&D activities. Um, and I'm actually wondering if there's any sort of alignment that you see between what the G7 is working on and um, the potential, the proposal that's being put out by the WHO and India on a medical countermeasures platform. So I'm curious as to how much alignment or how much discussion there's been between those two processes. And then if there's anything more that you could add on just, so you talked about sort of the dual use technology element and sort of that, the importance of that approach. Uh, would love to hear if there's more specificity around some of the key recommendations you have around that. So just, those are my two questions, thank you. Thank you, Philip. Um, we have one other question that's R&D related, so let me loop these together from um, Atsuko um, Matsunaga. Building on the achievements of our G7 predecessors, um, will the recommendations from this task force be shared with the G7 Science and Technology Ministers Group? Um, referring back to the 2016 Sukuba, um, Sukuba communique, the G7 S&T ministers committed to promoting R&D and NTDs such as mapping, sharing information to enhance R&D for MCMs after uh, the COVID pandemic. Um, we wanna keep coherence with this previous past commitments. And so your reflections on that, as well as Philip's two questions, maybe Dr. Cooney, if I can go back to you. Yes, um, the first question of uh, co coordination, this is kind of a, one of my concerns. As you might know that, uh, you know, pandemic preparedness, especially, uh, the vaccine is quite well organized by um, CEPI and others, and uh, quite uh, yeah uh, well discussed in terms of uh, you know priority setting and uh, the priority you know the um, viral pathogens etc. Even uh, local production is uh, well advanced for uh, vaccine, but not so much in a. Uh, uh, you know, tr uh, treatment, uh, therapeutics, and uh, diagnostics. Diagnostics could be maybe coordinated under FIND, 
and uh, WHO and others, uh, but they need more kind of uh, uh, efforts, especially they are thinking kind of, uh, uh, they are telling that the lacking of uh, some budget for that uh, uh, multi-year planning. Therapeutics, as you know, that, that we need uh, maybe more uh, chemicals. So uh, we need to start uh, also uh, discoveries, maybe needing uh, um, the AI based uh, discovery and screening. And of course, uh, repurposing uh, drugs is also, of course, uh, quite important. So uh, we could be, uh, you know, kind of uh, work uh, together. I know that there are some networks, but not very good, much global. Uh, there are some good networking for. Uh, this uh, therapeutics in uh, uh, US, uh, but maybe better to connect with uh, you know Asia and others. So uh, maybe uh, this G7, I hope uh, G7 could kind of uh, facilitate or kind of push that kind of uh, uh, coordination. Um, actually, I'm not so much kind of familiar with uh, this at Cuba, uh, the science uh, you know ministers kind of work. So uh, I'm not so much sure. But uh, uh, this time uh, they would the health ministers. Uh, we'll meet together in uh, uh, Nagasaki. Nagasaki is uh, quite well known for, of course, atomic bomb. At the same time, there is a uh, Institute of Tropical Medicine, uh, and also Nagasaki University is kind of promoting planetary health. So uh, I hope uh, they would have a kind of good discussion. And we also also having uh, uh, some kind of events uh, to uh, accelerate this uh, R&D, especially for NTT uh, between GHIT and uh, Nagasaki University. So if some of you, uh, any of you are interested, we can invite uh, you for that one. Uh, maybe I missed uh, one more question, I think, sorry. <laughs> I, I think that um, that's good. And in the interest of time, we'll move on because we have a number of other questions I want to get to. Um, uh, we have a, a audience member, Moga Kamalyani. Hi, Moga, has been waiting patiently with her hand up. Um, so Moga, uh, we'll, oh, the floor is yours to ask your question or comment. So yeah, thank you. Um, and uh, clearly, the, the the presentation covers the key issues of on, on health at the moment. So thank you for that. Um, and there's a lot of talk about R and D, as I could see. How, however, what I would like to to say is that to um, focus it on 100 days is really, and I know that came from Britain, from the G7 in, in the UK. Um, it is really focusing on the current system. It doesn't allow for, so like, you know, it's mRNA, but particularly who you can develop in 100 days, but it, it means that it will be developed the way it has been developed, basically by researchers in the North, whether it's university or company, it doesn't matter, but it's, it's, it's people in the North, not people in the South. So I think we, we need the, 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 the G7 to look at their role in promoting, in enabling, not promoting. Promote is a very weak word. That's for a start. Promote doesn't mean, you know, I can promote anything and, and not do anything. But the, as a G7 leaders, they should um, enable developing countries to, to, um, uh, to develop um, their, their own R&D. So we talk about manufacturing hub, how, hubs, how about R&D hubs? Um, and I, I really emphasize we need commitment from the G7. We don't need promotion or encouragement or anything like that. We need commitment and we need them to enable developing countries to lead. So we don't talk about domestic financing. It's like you guys should, should put some money here. No, we talk about you lead and you lead by your kind of prioritizing health in your country and prioritizing medical research in your country. So you have to do that. Otherwise, we will end up with the same situation. If we have a pandemic next year or even the next five years, you know, we will be relying on Moderna who still haven't shared and refused to share um, knowledge and technology um, and um, with, with South Africa. We need more of South Africa hub, which means again, the G7 commitment to sharing three things, knowledge, technology, and removing the barrier of I O of IP for the for the quick kind of response to the to an pandemic, whether it's 100 days or 10 days, it's commitment to sharing allocation. So if we say health workers need to be vaccinated as priority group, it's like what WHO said in May 2020: health workers all over the world. Not health workers, then old people, then young people, then every people in the U in the US first. No, it's health workers across the globe first. So we need that commitment 
to that sharing, share of doses, share of knowledge and technology and removing IP. And also, but just one, one last thing for health workers. I don't think we need to appreciate health workers. I think, you know, we used to clap for them every Thursday here in the UK. My daughter said to me, stop clapping because she's a health worker. She said, stop clapping. This doesn't give me food on the table. What we need is people to campaign for better payment, better working condition, better training for health workers. That's what the G7 should commit to. No appreciation with words because this is the easy thing. Thank you. Thank you, Moga. Well said. Um, I want to read uh, a question from Yumiko, Yumiko Hori. Um, the paper recommends the G7 to explore a global knowledge hub on sustainable and efficient UHC financing, including domestic resource mobilization. Countries need financing and technical support for country-led efforts for DRM, building resilient health systems, eliminating out-of-pocket payments to achieve UHC. How do you envisage the knowledge hub to address and support these issues. Uh, very important point. Let me also just, in the interest of time, flag some of the other questions. We have Mohammed Afsal, who back on the R&D question, um, has um, uh, raised uh, uh, the fact that um, during the epidemic, almost all of the health system's resources were focused on dealing with the treatment of patients. Of course, we know that had um, dramatic effects on just delivery of routine and essential health services. What are your recommendations to help low and middle income countries ensure that promising interventions are tested and priority? We've seen many cases where trials did start even after the peak of transmission passed. How can we make it more efficient and responsive? And then um, we have, uh, let me uh, also flag, and I will come back to a couple of colleagues, uh, but just because I know we lose Dr. Cooney in a for a minute. Um, uh, also from uh, Arush Lal um, on the topic of UHC. Um, uh, do you have recommendations on specific gaps in PPR that could benefit from concrete UHC interventions? Uh, and should these be institutionalized in the pandemic accord? Um, IHR regulations and the medical countermeasures platform. So some rich comments there, and Sarah, I'll come, out, I'll come back to the others in a minute. But let me, uh, in the interest of time, turn back to Dr. Uh, Cooney and Dr. Shiriyama for some quick reflections on those comments before we go to the remaining questions. Yeah, thank you very much. So first, um, we need the voices from uh, Global South. Because a like commitment, you know, the, from G7 to Africa and others, just one way is not so good. That is why we are uh, involving, especially the African CDC and other, you know, the uh, organization from Africa and the other Asia and others. And uh, we hear some of the voices, but not too big. We need, uh, you know, big voices from them and a more kind of concrete uh, idea and plan also. Otherwise, um, you know, kind of a one-way commitment from a G7 to toward the, you know, the global south might not be a quite fair and uh, kind of a strong. And then uh, regarding knowledge hub, it is very, very important. So uh, uh, actually we need more kind of information and what kind of, um, uh, you know, knowledge hub, especially kind of purposes and kind of a, a way of, uh, you know, the disseminating or collecting uh, we also need. But uh, uh, if you have any, concrete idea maybe it's good to to have a discussion or maybe if you have a kind of networking uh you can uh you know introduce to us because we already have uh, some of the academia kind of networking in uh, uh the asia and in japan um actually yeah we are discussing that kind of mcm for the treatment and others but of course like ppe and uh, you know other uh, public health measures for prevention or the cutting that uh, transmission is very very critical, and it really need a kind of innovation. So uh, it is kind of an area which we also um, much include in that uh, kind of R and T also. I may not respond to everything, but uh, maybe better to stop here. Dr. Cuny, I know you need to leave uh, in a minute. Um, any final reflections on just overall the conversation and from where you sit. Um, obviously, you've done this work for the task force, but you have an important day job with the Global Health Innovation Technology Fund, GHIT. So 
uh, you will remain uh, very much in the center of this conversation and engaged with none, not only the Japanese government, but with other major um, uh, you know, uh, donors and countries, partners. And so any other reflections on, uh, I guess, uh, also how we can best ensure that we take this agenda forward and get traction with political leaders? So any yeah. advice maybe you have for us as well? Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> Maybe one last word. Uh, you know, this G7 is not the kind of end, but it is kind of one of the process. And uh, we are also thinking some kind of side event and also after this G7 to have uh, some kind of, um, uh, you know, roadmap setting or more kind of concrete actions uh, to be discussed. So if you have, uh, you know, any kind of uh, uh, idea or if you have uh, any kind of discussion uh, even during that um, uh, UN uh, high level meeting because we also you know kind of holding we are thinking some of the uh, discussion or side event in um, New York uh, so uh, we can use you know variety of uh, kind of milestones or such kind of events for really kind of a, a materialize kind of our concept into a kind of action so uh, I just want to uh, add uh, that kind of comments but anyway thank you very much and uh, <laughs> Uh, looking forward to your kind of contribution and uh, the support. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Kinney, for joining us. Um, we have a, we have about nine more minutes, so I'm going to take the final round of questions, and then Dr. Shiri Almas turn to you for some final thoughts and reflections. Um, I wanted to acknowledge the comment and question in the chat, which actually is to Rosemary um, from Sarah Abe, who um, was also a task force member, um, and regarding country leadership. Um, agreeing with your point, do you have additional suggestions, Rosemary, for how the G7 can encourage and support um, country leadership in addition to the points that have been raised by Dr. Cooney? So maybe, Rosemary, if you want to take that one. Yeah, I think two points from me on that one. One is that um, the G7 leadership will need to recognize that there are national and regional um, health financing targets that already exist and I think the best thing and, and, and most supportive thing would be to connect with the with the regional uh, processes the regional targets the regional there are so many policies that um, regional leaders have come together and defined how that needs to be done and I think it's not an establishment of a new thing or coming up with something else but it's to say how can we within the framework of what has been agreed among by African leaders, for example, if you think of, about Africa, can that be supported to materialize? I think the other thing is um, we have, you know, like, for example, we have the African Union and US summit. We have the EU and Africa summit. We have China, I mean, Japan uh, with a TICAD process. I think those are really great processes where we can begin to see G7 members providing um, some kind of uh, consultation and dialogue process, because I don't think G7 leadership can possibly have a meeting and actually um, and agree among themselves in the absence of low and middle income countries. I think it needs to be a dialogue, it needs to be a conversation. And I think those summits have shown us that there's a lot to be done in terms of balancing the discussion and the consultation, but I think it's a really good entry point in the long term. I think in the long term, we have platforms that bring uh, low and middle income countries together with the G7 members. And I think it can go beyond just the G7 summit into other platforms for engagement. Thanks, Rosemary. And then we had one final question in the chat that I just wanted to um, pose before I turn it over to Dr. Shiriano. Um, thank you for your excellent presentations. A key lesson learned during COVID-19 is the need to plan for access earlier in the R&D process. Thoughts on how to strengthen that type of access interventions and coordination. Um, I think that was a question to all the speakers, but um, in the interest of time, Dr. Shirama, let me turn it back to you. You've heard a lot of rich comments and feedback from our various speakers and um, uh, audience members. Obviously, this is a very big agenda that the task force has been uh, trying to uh, you know, uh, bring together in a concerted fashion. I understand how difficult that is to do given, given the, the magnitude of the issues and also the interconnectivity um, that you have spoken so well about. But 
some final reflections from you on what you've heard, um, but also where do you anticipate progress? What can we hope that this won't just be another G7 meeting that talks about all the things but doesn't actually drive action as some of our colleagues have said, because that is the key. How can we make sure, of course, there will be more to do. This is one moment as Dr. Cooney said, but it is also a lot of hope is placed that the wealthiest economies in the world will actually make some significant steps forward and some substantial commitments on these agenda items, including substantial new investments. So over to you for some final thoughts on what you've heard and how we ensure uh, that there's there's progress going forward. Yeah, uh, thank, thank you very much. And uh, maybe I'd like to respond to a few of the concrete questions then giving back the feedback to the Caroline's point and what should be measured after the uh, G7 meeting. So relating to the access issue, which was uh, introduced at the last moment and uh, a kind of the access by design is very important, you know, the thinking about R&D, the access issue, that is not the way to think about. So those two have to be integrated since the beginning, access by design or access initiative. That, that's a basic idea we'd like to promote. So how it can be actually implemented is the big issue to think about and also should be evaluated. That's the first point. And another specific issue I'd like to respond is that the, the knowledge hub issue. And uh, concerning that, what was said by uh, Horie Sam perhaps is exactly what we are thinking about. The reason why he put the issue is that, you know, thinking about operationalization of the UHC, it's not, a not just a national government level issue, more the local government issue and uh, local financing arrangement seems to be very important thinking about the historical development of UHC in Japan since around the 1960s. So how, how that kind of knowledge can be more uh, explicit and how can it be shared among, among the, 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 the countries? Those are the kind of one example of the thing we are thinking about. So very similar to what uh, you mentioned in your comment. And uh, one another the small the response to the question is that issue of the uh, science and technology minister communicate on the NTD. That, that's interesting in that, you know, we are claiming that we need to have an intersectoral approach or whole of the government approach, but actually not so easy, you know. Relating to the global health issue between the health, mini, health and the finance, we have relatively good collaboration and including the foreign ministries. But beyond that, the collaboration is actually limited. Uh, thinking about one health approach, we need to include the agriculture ministry or the environmental ministry, but still not enough. And also the improvement of the science and technology in ministry is also a one of the challenge we encountered during the process. For example, we emphasize the importance of the R&D organization of the collaboration, but uh, sometimes ministries in charge of the science and technology are thinking about the domestic issues, not so much about the international issues. So sometimes difficult. So, you know, maybe I can uh, think of that that kind of difficulty exists. So maybe how to overcome that step by step is very important. Now, finally, you know, what should be the cornerstone, you know, which should be evaluated after the G7? The, the one of the big issue might be the, the coordination on the specific point, you know, the coordination between the R&D part or then the access part, and also coordination among the different um, the financing arrangement for dealing with the UHC achievement on each countries. So how, how, how can we make sure the kind of the concrete mechanism and how can it work? That, that, that should be the, you know, the important uh, key uh, point which need to be uh, accomplished and need to be assessed. Okay, anyway, thank you very much for your the input. So we direct the, the, uh, the operationalize the process through the G7 and beyond that. And as Kuni uh, Sensei mentioned that the, if you can bring us a concrete idea, we, we very welcome and we direct to work with you uh, for following even after the G7 event. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Shiriyama. Thank you for your leadership of the task force and of this very important endeavor. Thanks to Dr. Cooney. I want to thank Rosemary, Nabil, and Gozi for being here and sharing your 
experience and reflections for all of you for joining us this morning. Great questions and comments. I know there were uh, there's uh, a lot of also expertise in this room, a virtual room that we were not able to uh, uh, share today. But as Dr. Shiraoma said, this is a live conversation. The task force has its recommendations, but uh, continuing to be more concrete on that. So we, if you have additional comments or questions or concrete suggestions, as Dr. Shiraoma said, uh, uh, please share them with us and we will make sure that they reach the task force. Um, so with that, I just want to thank everyone for uh, spending the last 90 minutes with us, wherever you are around the world. Um, uh, this very important conversation uh, to our Japanese colleagues. We're looking forward to a very fruitful and action-oriented G7 uh, uh, health ministerial, but also most importantly, G7 leaders uh, summit uh, and to can, you know, make sure the legacy of this G7 presidency is, uh, is very impactful for the world on uh, global health and on pandemic prevention, preparedness and response and UHC. Thank you all and have a good day, night, wherever you are. Okay, thank you. Thank you.